Okay. All right, welcome to our third session this afternoon. Those of you who are members of the uh, Northern Virginia Astronomy Club, well, I know Paul Derby as our former Novak treasurer and is a very active engagement with the, the club and uh, outreach at the Novak Star Parties and also at Sky Meadows. Uh, we usually don't talk that much about jobs, but, but in, in Paul's case, with this particular topic, I want to say a few words about it because he's particularly well qualified to talk about how new technology is refine, redefining public access to astronomy. He's a uh, quite an accomplished uh, technology guru. Uh, for our senior leadership partner at Gartner, uh, a strategy consultant on technology and IT management and enterprise systems integration, a former chief architect for the Atari Group and a chief information officer for Binary Consulting. He was uh, has served as a chief technology officer both at SRA International and uh, for CSE's uh, telecommunication services business. Uh, he was a uh, senior partner at CSC on consulting and systems integration, and he managed the uh, system integration uh, worldwide for a control data corporation. So uh, quite a wealth of being on the forefront of technology. And but early in his career, he's also a computer science uh, faculty at uh, State University in New York and was uh, regularly a featured speaker on the IT emerging information technology and industry conferences. Paul is going to talk to us about uh, this this emerging technology we're seeing with Unistellar and similar scopes. And at that point, Paul, I'm going to shut up because people want to hear you talk. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Dan. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah, you're good. Yeah, good. I, I, I muted, toggled back and forth. And this is actually the first time I presented on Google Meet, although I've monitored, um, monitored it dozens of talks for Novak uh, as a sysadmin for this thing. So it's a little strange seeing it from this side, uh, but here we go. Um, it's nice to be with you today. And uh, we're talking about something that's been quite a journey for me over about the last five years, the last two where I actually got my hands on this device. Uh, the EV scope started out with a Kickstarter project. <clears throat> and this was kind of like putting a beer in front of an alcoholic when they announced this thing. Uh, there was a small, a uh, team in Marseille, France called Unistellar, a handful of people, and um, they uh, fiddled around trying to figure out a way to make uh, electronic assisted astronomy easy for everyone. And uh, they built some prototypes and uh, got to the point to where they could try and have something conceptualized enough that they could get backers for it. So they uh, put something out on Kickstarter and and uh, they very quickly got uh, over 2,000 backers that pledged over $2.2 million to bring the project to life, which blew their minds. And uh, so you can imagine, like, what do you do when you're understaffed and you've got untested technology and you're, you've got 2,000 people betting that you're going to pull it off? And so uh, I admire them for doing it. All of us that were backing it knew that our money was at risk. So anyway, I was backer number 631 and I pledged 1300 bucks in 2017 to support the project. At that time, they guessed they would have it out and ready about 2019. And like most technology uh, people, they were over optimistic and it uh, turned into more than just the technology. They had to figure out how to distribute all of these things around the world and and. Uh, how to get uh, manufacturing done in China and how to do this and how to do that, all the things that it takes to bring a product, uh, project to life. But they did it. And um, when they announced it, it was amazing the feedback that they got. There were uh, lots of people that put their money up there, but there was another group of people, plenty of astronomers, particularly on cloudy nights and even in our own Novak discussion group, that expressed doubts about the project and considered it hype claims and suspected funding fraud and all sorts of things. I put a couple of posts out on the Novak uh, listserv and um, got enough feedback that I said, you know, this is kind of in there with, with uh, global warming and LED lasers and other topics that we've had to moderate the listserv on. So I think I'll just back off from talking about the EV scope for a few years and just talk privately to a couple of people, but uh, didn't want to dangle it out there too much because people seem to get emotional about these, the claims these people were making. But anyway, I crossed my fingers and hoped that it would uh, happen. 
and they send out status emails uh, pretty much every month. And after 50 status emails, they closed it. Uh, by then, they had delivered 5,600 of these telescopes despite COVID getting in the road which didn't help them. They were trying to learn how to do the supply chain stuff and manufacturing and all that. And then COVID comes along and screws all that up. I think a bunch of the telescopes that came here sat in Los Angeles probably from February till June till when I got mine in uh, June of 2020. So just to show you what the early stuff looked like before the Kickstarter project, here's what they put together and uh, and Phil just talked about seeing the uh, bubble nebula and the ring nebula is pretty similar, I would imagine, through binoculars. Here's what it looked like through an EV scope prototype. So here's what they were hoping to bring to market with what they had cobbled together, kind of in a breadboard faction back in October of 2017. And this whetted the appetite of enough people that they could get them to go to work for their company and be in a startup. And then here's another one. Uh, they were showing it off in San Francisco. It's an image of M31, the Hercules cluster. And right when they were doing it, it was photobombed by an airplane landing at San Francisco International, which is, oh, maybe uh, eight or 10 miles south of uh, where they were uh, showing this up on the hill of the Legion of Honor. Uh, what it did show, though, is some people were accusing them of just storing uh, these objects in a database and showing them electronically instead of actually collecting the photons and integrating them. And uh, when they got photobombed by an airplane, it showed that they really were collecting photons. So that was the goodness in this one. So here's my first light with the scope that I got, and we'll get into the, you know, what went on uh, in the last couple of years. But on the left side is is uh, is what uh, I got uh, the first time I turned it on, and what I didn't realize I needed to do was to take a dark frame. Uh, because I hadn't read the manual as it's always I've always found I don't know why I should read the manuals ahead but I always read them after the fact you know <laughs> and then figure out oh I should have done this should have done that so anyway I didn't read the manual turned the thing on <clears throat> and like magic it found uh, the Whirlpool Galaxy M51 and it started collecting photons and after 44 seconds I was just sitting there there saying oh my gosh this thing is just incredible this was in June of 2020 and here these things were just appearing on a, on an iPhone that was uh, uh, hooked up by Wi-Fi over to this telescope. And so I brought it back and um, threw it into uh, on my Mac and put it in the, the photo editing software that just comes native on the Mac, the photo program, and, uh, and con adjusted the contrast. And then I put it in Topaz Denoise and got rid of the noise. And there's what came out of it with... Uh, Two click contrast adjustment and a denoise adjustment. So I literally used these two applications and just clicked on two tools and that was it. So this is very, very lightly manipulated. And I said, this thing really has some possibilities. And this was release number one. So this whetted my appetite a little more. So before we get into it, let's just talk about the Unistellar products and what the one particular one I'm going to talk about. Uh, I got the EV Scope 1. It is no longer available. You may be able to pick them up at places like B&H Photo. They sell used ones or maybe, um, you know, some of the uh, major astronomy uh, shops that sell used equipment or on uh, maybe eBay or possibly Craigslist. They've replaced it with the EV Scope 2. There weren't enough differences when the EV Scope 2 came out about a year ago for me to say, oh, I'm going to spend the money to upgrade. They were so close i didn't worry about it and then they took the ev scope one and cost reduced it a little bit and came up with something called the the equinox eqinox and all the details are on the uh, unistellar web page but anyway the one where the red arrow is pointing is is the the one that we're going to talk about today and they're very similar the others are you know it's probably 85 or 90 percent the same but uh, if you buy one now you would be getting an ev scope two or you could get an Equinox if you wanted a cost reduced one. Okay, here's the details. Here it is set up on the sidewalk in front of my house. Uh, this is at dusk and the, and the uh, sodium light, street light uh, across the street is spilling over right into the front yard. It's a Newtonian telescope. It has a four and a half inch aperture, has a 450 millimeter focal length, it's F4 which gives you about 50x optical magnification. 
it's an alt as mount as you can see you know it gets kind of sets up there on the side and it has a couple of motors in it inside it has the a, a reasonable uh, reasonably priced sony uh, sensor and this is the interesting thing it's sitting on a really nice tripod uh, coming from france i guess it's genetically set up to where they make nice tripods after you know it's the french people that make get so this tripod isn't as good as a get so uh, but it is darn near close and it's way better than most anything i've i've gotten uh, except maybe some of the higher end man photos and uh, uh, and so it's it's really a decent uh, lightweight but very stable tripod for this particular thing i bought an extra they they came out during the kickstarter program with a backpack and i put the uh, I bought that too. Here I am standing with the telescope and the tripod that straps on the side. And the whole thing weighs 20 pounds and it'll fit in the overhead compartment in an airplane. And uh, so we'll go through my initial experience with this. So I put the backpack on with the tripod strapped on, uh, walked out the front door of the house and walked four doors down the street to kind of get away from one street light to get to a couple of more. Can't get away from them all because there's a church parking lot down there and I could set up over kind of and block one of the, the uh, street lights of the tree. And I level the tripod, uh, put the bubble level on the tripod. There's a bubble level that's built into the tripod and I don't think you can see it. It's covered up in this particular view I've got. I went on Amazon and bought a big bubble level for my 74 year old eyes, instead of trying to squint at the little bitty thing. And this is provoked proved to be a very good investment. It, I just put it in the bag with the telescope and I can get it right on the money for level. So that's one thing I don't have to worry about. And that's about the only thing you have to worry about with this telescope. There's two things. You have to get it level and you have to focus it yourself. Other than that, it does the rest. And then I uh, connect my, I uh, turn the EV scope on and uh, connect an iPhone up to the EV scope's Wi-Fi access point. And then I launched the Unistellar app. Um, and then I slew to a place in the sky with stars. And I can just see this on the screen of the uh, iPhone. And then part of the uh, of the lens cover in the EV scope is a patent off mask. And so you kind of, it just, uh, you twist it a little bit and it pops out. You put it on the end of the EV scope and then adjust to where you've got a nice uh, batten off mask um, focus. And here it is in focus. This is the one I did last night, actually. I just did these shots last night. And then you uh, go in and pick an object from the list and uh, and uh, find out what you want to look at first. And then you say, go to this. And uh, then you watch the scope slew and center on the object and start observing. So I picked M13, the Hercules globular cluster. And here where the yellow arrow is pointing, it's slowing to M13 and off it goes. And, and then it comes back and it says, go to validated. At this point, it's done a series of successive approximations and it's done plate solving. And, uh, and so it's figured out where Hercules is. You don't have to set the thing up in any direction you want. You just get it leveled and it figures, the scope figures it out. It's just like magic. I've got an older Ioptron Mini Tower Pro, and it'll kind of get to things if you uh, if you polar align it. So you don't have to do any polar aligning. You don't have to do any, uh, uh, you know, if you can't see um, Polaris, you don't have, which I can't where I live. You know, you don't have to do drift alignments and this kind of stuff. So it's, it's pretty cool the way this works. And then once it's there, you can click this button down at the bottom and that says do enhance vision and so uh, uh, when we were looking at it before here's what you see in real time and then when you go into enhance vision it starts doing four second sub exposures I'm, uh, and here's four minutes worth so after four minutes we got up to this point with hercules and uh, and then here's 11 minutes and this is just raw, right? Right there, you know, and uh, what you see. And this uh, just is pretty incredible <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. And no, you're not looking at it live, but what you're looking at 
uh, this particular one's 11 minutes. So if you're doing four seconds, you know, there's 15 of them a minute, and 15 times 11 is how many images. And then it goes through and throws away the ones where the, the lasers shine through it, or like you had the, um, the photo bombing, the airplane bombing that happened in San Francisco I showed you earlier. Um, and so you, it just keeps gathering, and then all the images that are good that uh, fit within certain parameters, you know, within the, uh, the, uh, the, the test of reasonableness that they do, it integrates them all and stacks them for you and keeps showing them. And it, it works on diminishing returns. Every time you double the exposure, it gets better. And this works up until you get up to about uh, an hour. And so you get marked improvement from four to eight, eight to 16, 16 to 32 minutes, 32 to 64 minutes, it, it kind of drops off. Okay, here are some of the things that you can get here. And you saw a lot of this, uh, uh, you know, back just before when uh, Phil was talking about what you could see with binoculars. And uh, here's uh, M42, the Great Nebula in Orion. This is a favorite of uh, what I've been showing out at Sky Meadows. I had uh, one very nice uh, woman who told me that, uh, that just above these three stars in Orion, that that's where the rapture was going to occur. And that's when people would come out of heaven because these are the gates of heaven. And they would be on their way down to uh, take care of things here on earth and probably make sure that we're all uh, judged and go to wherever we need to go. And that was pretty interesting. I, I started to get into a conversation with her about when these people were going to start their journey, considering how many light years away this is, but we didn't go there. And I just moved on to uh, the other people that were out there that wanted to look at this. Uh, just as a side matter, in the last couple of years I've been there, I think I've shown this scope, uh, the results of the scope to about 1,500 people at Sky Meadows. We generally get about, in the coldest months, we'll get 60 people that'll show up when the temperature is 15 degrees. And when it's warm, we'll have two or 300 people that show up out there. Here's some other examples. Here's M51 and it's uh, NGC neighbor. I, are these coming through okay? I guess so. Yeah, these look great, Paul. Okay, great, okay. And, uh, and then if you wanna go through, the, the Messier objects lend themselves to this scope very, very well. It's just about the right, uh, magnification and about the right aperture where you stack it to where what uh, Charles Messier could see back in the 1700s, you can see they, they optimize it for, for these particular objects. So if you need, if you want to look at deep space objects where you need 3000 millimeters of focal length, this isn't the scope for you because they'll just be very tiny. And if you need to see real wide stuff where you need, you know, a 35 millimeter lens and you're using a sky tracker, or if you maybe need a, you know, an, um, a 400 mil, I'm sorry, a two or 300 millimeter lens. You can do that, but you have to uh, build up panels to do it. And plenty of people have integrated it. And so kind of here's what you get. This is uh, uh, stuff that Ray Young has put. It's what he's seen in the last year. He's been pretty active on the Facebook uh, Unistellar page. And it's pretty similar. I've, I've also captured most of the stuff, but I haven't gone to the trouble of putting it all together like he did. So I just stood on his shoulders and, and used what he has there. And then it, it's not that great for planetary stuff and lunar stuff. If you look in the lower right-hand corner, you can see, um, you know, the moon. And uh, it, you can do better. It's really optimized for um, collecting photons, not for taking reflected light from a planetary surface and dealing with that. And that has to do with the uh, four-second exposure time. And you can go in if you want to manually mess around with the gain and mess around with uh, exposure links and that kind of stuff, but it gets it out of the sweet spot that the scope works best in. And so as long as you stick to the plenty of stuff that's out there, especially in our light polluted skies, that that this is very good at, at uh, sussing out if the photons that make it past the drifting clouds and the, and the haze and all of that, it works pretty well. So let's look at it and how I've used it in outreach. Here's what Sky Meadows looks at about an hour or two before, about an hour and a half or two hours before the 200 people show up. And we set up in this, this wonderful uh, hardware eating field. The grass is just long enough that if you drop a screw or a lens cap or your sunglasses in there, you can't find it. 
until the next day. <laughs> but anyway, so I'm pretty careful on the knobs that hold the scope uh, that I don't pull them out too far to set the scope in the cup in the top. But there's what the scope looks like set up. There is an eyepiece that in the two years I haven't taken the cap off of it to look because all it looks at is a little screen inside. And instead, uh, there's a, an iPad on a stand that I use uh, for the crowd to stand around, and that worked really well. And then I could sit to the side when we were doing this through COVID with my mask on and talk to them, and they were six feet away, and they could stand in whatever family clusters they wanted to up to about uh, eight or 10 or 15 people at a time. You very clearly see it. It's a iPad Pro Max, so it's the big iPad that's about a 16-inch screen. I have a Jackery power supply down at the bottom just to make sure that the iPad stays going, but I have yet to have to use an external power supply with the with the EV scope that's sitting there in the front because it, uh, it runs light on the internal batteries. I just charge them up and go. And I've got plenty of power left if I leave at 1 or 2 a.m. in the morning. And so this particular telescope, unlike every scope I've owned and almost every scope that I've seen, runs with zero wires. So there is no cable management needed. It's zero. It's That's just amazing. It just uses Wi-Fi to get across. And it doesn't use Bluetooth either. Instead, it uses TCP IP and Wi-Fi. And so... You know, each one hooks up to its own access point. The access point is unique. It's based on the serial number of the telescope. And so we've had up to four of these EV scopes now. It's caught on and a number of people have bought them in the club. And we had four of them out there one evening and they were all set, set up in uh, Wi-Fi distance of each other, but they all work just fine. Um, if you look on the ground, you see some orange things sticking up. Those are called orange screws. And I'll show you a little bit on that. I learned the first night that I was out there that when people gather around it in the dark, they tend to kick over the stand that the that the thousand dollar iPad is on. And I caught it the first time and I said, oh, well, where I was sitting in the chair, I don't want to do that again. <laughs> and so I learned to anchor the thing. And uh, the backpack that it came in is sitting there on a table. I put that little table there to keep it from sitting in the wet dew if it happens. Then there's just a container store plastic thing to you know, just carry some odds and ends and a jacket if I need it. And uh, underneath the the uh, plastic bin is a, is a thing stonemasons use for kneeling on to set tile. I bought it at a masonry store. I can get them at Home Depot. It's just a kneeling pad. And it works great for anchoring the stuff on the ground. Um, so I showed you first where I level the tripod. Then I stake it down with these iPad stand, stand legs. They just screw in the ground and the, the holder they come in is this tube. And then you just take it out and shove it in there and screw it in the ground. And then I just use some bungee cord to uh, tie the stand to the uh, to the hook on the on the orange screws. I've got all this stuff on Amazon. And then these this little black thing with a red light on it is an LED light and it's a keychain. And they cost about, I don't know, I got 10 of them for 10 or 15 of them for six bucks on eBay. And they have a switch where you can turn it all the way on. And so it just sits and glows in the grass where people can see where the legs are. So this was the first lesson learned. And these are the only accessories I bought for the EV scope. So they were pretty minimal. And you can actually use them on, on any sort of imaging rig. It doesn't have to be an EV scope. So these are the useful items there. And there it is set up from a different view. And uh, all set up for outreach and for all the people to to show up. Okay, here are the reactions that I've been getting. They gravitate to the iPad screen just like uh, uh, the bugs at night gravitate to a light bulb. It's just incredible. They just see it and they say, wham, they go over there. Oh, what's on the screen? And uh, when I'm when I tell it, what I do is uh, I'll just tell people, let's pick an object and we'll talk about various objects and someone may suggest something or I'll pick something if they don't. And in this particular case, uh, I said, let's go to Sagittarius. And they can see the stars fly by on the screen when it slews, and then it'll stop, and, and then it'll plate solve, and then it'll slew again, and it'll plate solve. And it may do it three times, it may do it two times until the object is perfectly centered. And then if they have lots of questions about the objects, the EV scope has lots of answers. All you do is just scroll up on the screen that they're looking at, and it tells you, you know, all about. Uh, what's there. And in this particular 
thing we were looking at uh, in the constellation, we were looking for uh, the Triffid Nebula, SA20. Okay. And uh, and then when once they've seen it, um, here we're looking at the, uh, I was looking last night at the Eagle Nebula. Uh, I can either text or email the messages while the scope is building up images, and this has huge crowd appeal. And uh, last night when I was sitting in the church parking lot, um, while this thing was looking at the Eagle Nebula, I texted to Dan, Dan, Eagle Nebula tonight from Falls Church, and Dan replied back, uh, there it is delivered. And I could, you can, and if, uh, and this is from my particular device, and the audience that there, if they have uh, smart devices themselves, if they have an Android or they have an iPhone, up to 10 of them can also hook up in observer mode and they can capture the images from the scope along with me. And the way the uh, software is set up in this telescope, even though it builds up a network between the operator device, my device, and the observers, their devices, to the Wi-Fi access point, it also leaves the cellular connection. I use T-Mobile, the cellular connection stays going and you can pop around to different apps while this thing is busy collecting uh, photons back in the telescope and send email messages and send uh, text messages to people of what you're seeing or, or whatever you want. So that's pretty um, pretty incredible. And that so people leave with souvenirs of what they see and if uh, other people aren't imaging and uh, and I'm not worried about blowing out you know an image or two on this, I use a green laser pointer and point where the scope is pointing so that I can say, here is where this telescope is collecting photons. You can't see anything with your eyes, but here's what it's seeing because it's collecting these photons that are making it down here. Uh, there's nothing in the scope that amplifies anything. It has to take care of what arrives. So that's that's how it works. So let's talk about what makes this thing different and, uh, and uh, how it differs from what we've done traditional astronomy for many, many years. There's a great quote by Isaac Newton. If I, have, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And the EV scope is exactly what it does. It allows you to see further, standing on the shoulders of giants that figured out all of this stuff that's listed below. So these are the various technologies that they didn't invent, but other people invented. And they went through software systems, software engineering and systems engineering. And then what they did that very few people have, have been able to do in astronomy hardware and solutions is focus on the end user experience with their systems integration. So they literally have made a device that you can turn on and within 10 minutes be observing. And I don't know of anyone else that has done that. And uh, the times I've taken this out to Crockett and at Sky Meadows, I sat next to people that spend an hour cabling and adjusting and polar aligning and doing all sorts of stuff while people are tracing by looking at this thing and we're looking at various nebulas and globular clusters and, and, um, and new galaxies and this sort of stuff. So if you want to see what's inside of it, uh, oh, back on the innovation and what's inside of it. Over in the left is the kind of the 10 agreed upon, generally agreed upon things that, that uh, go into innovation. And this telescope definitely is an innovative type thing. And they hit the button probably on seven or eight or you know maybe nine of these particular innovation types. Uh, I don't think they've made any money yet, even though it's a bit expensive, uh, but they've hit all the others and uh, as the uh, numbers go up or the manufacturing costs go down, they'll hit it probably in the profit model. Um, if you want to know what's going on in the innovation, if you go over, if you want to see the technical insight into it, you can read Jan Kaiser's reverse engineering notes on GitHub and just go on Google or Bing or whatever, you, whatever your favorite search engine is and search for uni unistellar EV scope research and GitHub. And that'll take you to GitHub and there, he talks about all the hardware and software and all the stuff that's in there and where he's reverse engineered it. I didn't take the cover off mine, but he took the cover off his. And here's a picture of what's inside of it. And over there on the left is a board they designed and it's sitting on top of a Raspberry Pi 3. 
and their custom board sits on top and that's where a lot of their stuff goes the stuff that allows them to do the successive approximation plate solving and the stuff to read up the database that's on the uh, raspberry pi uh, ssd card s uh, card chip that's inside the raspberry pi and the way it interacts with the um, with a sony camera and they initially started out with a 16 gigabyte uh, micro sd card that's plugged into that raspberry pi underneath um, they they moved it up to a 32 gig one if you exhaust your space it dumps into my iphone where i've got half a terabyte so i'm not going to run out of room and then when i and then that loads it into icloud and that loads it onto my mac where i can get to the the stuff from the cloud if i want to post process it later on so the storage isn't an issue even with 16 gig that i found so far but they've they've doubled that up but that's a trivial cost so they're in without getting into a lot of details is the technology behind this stuff so that is what i wanted to cover today and then i wanted to interact with you folks and see if you have any questions on it and uh, just and to see if you want to deep dive into the any of this i can definitely go into more um, and here's my contact information if you want to reach me anytime afterwards so there basically is the presentation okay uh let's see here Art, do you want to ask your question? Arthur? Let's see, Arthur. I can look over at the okay. chat. Is there some questions there? Arthur Linker, how were the images shown, downloaded, and processed? Uh, most of the images you saw weren't processed. And if they are processed, um, I use, uh, I use, uh, a, a, a package that uh, just gets denoises, Topaz uh, Laboratories is the name of the company, and they have a denoise app that I use that runs on either an iPad or, or on my Mac, and it gets rid of the noise in it. And I also use uh, a piece of software that, uh, that gets rid of gradients. You can do it with Photoshop, you can do it with GIMP. Uh, I've got another piece that's uh, called here. Uh, Affinity Photo. Yeah, Affinity Photo um, has a couple of tools in it, and one of them is there are astronomy tools that are in there, and you can just get rid of uh, a gradient. You have a, a street light. So I use it at times if the street light provides a gradient. Okay, Chris. So, got, um, uh, oh, go ahead, Art. Go ahead, Art. Yeah. So uh, were you downloading one stacked image, or were you downloading all these four second exposures? It, it does the stacking for me. And so uh, if you if you dig into it and pull out the SD card that's in it, you can get the individual four second exposures, but I've never done that. I just stop it, I just grab, during different time periods, you can click a control in the app and it will give you the object that you're imaging up to that point in time. Like I can, I'll grab it at four minutes and 10 minutes and 30 minutes, and then I can look to see if I'm getting any anything better and I can stop and go to something else or I can pick the, you know, the one that is still building up better detail and getting more detail. So that's, uh, and, uh, and all of that just, when I go from one object to another, it automatically puts it in my photo library on my smartphone, which automatically through the cloud puts it on my computer at home. So I don't have to download anything. I just open it up on the devices that I already have. Does that answer your question? Yes, thanks. Yeah, yeah. We, it's not as painful as you could get. If we take them in sequence, uh, Bob uh, Bunch had, had raised his hand, and then uh, uh, Chris, and then Bruce. Okay. So, Bob, are okay. you? Yeah, you better than that. Hi, Bob. This is Bob. This is hi, Paul. This is Bob. Um, I, I was I was a skeptic when this first thing when this when I saw the announcement, and I'm like, what the heck. You know, they're 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 never make this work. And I I'm uh, friends with uh, former astronomy magazine editor Richard Berry, and he was an early adopter. And and on his Facebook page, 
uh, when it first arrived, he methodically documented everything, taking it out, setting it up, first images. And then he proceeded to start to, you know, and he, he looked at the instrument as far as how it's built and, and how stable it is, like you sort of you talked about. And then he started to do show how he, you know, he started to demonstrate how he was collecting photons and doing some light curves and doing a little bit of science. And, and it became apparent pretty quick. It's, it's, it's a very impressive machine. Um, so uh, congratulations on having it and thanks for the great presentation. It's, it's neat. It's very, it's, it's a fascinating look into where the technology can take us. Yeah. Yeah. You're quite welcome. I have another one. If I'm going to take, uh, do, uh, astro imaging that I want to hang on the wall, I don't use this. I use this for outreach. If I'm going to take pictures that I want to hang on the wall, I've got a, you know, Nina and, um, and, um, you know, three, uh, uh, eight nanometer filters and RGB and and SHO and all that stuff, you know, the whole nine yards and uh, and a uh, uh, night crawler, rotator and focuser, all that stuff. And there's about 20 wires that go to it and it takes an hour or two to set up and all that. And that's the kind of thing you put in the backyard and you go to bed and you get up the next morning and then you use picks inside for three weeks and then you get your results. This is not that. You know, so, <laughs> so follow on question. My impression from what Richard's posted is it you've with this device, you have the ability to basically set it up and then join it, join basically an international network and allow others to access your your device, your machine to to collect science data. Have you have you played at all uh, 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 at all around with any of that sort of thing? Uh, no, there's that's their citizen science program, and it's a it's 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 funded through uh, SETI in Berkeley, you know, the old search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And uh, they're busy tracking down uh, exoplanets through occultations and things like that, and uh, in different asteroids, and they're quite successful. And they do it as groups, and they they have a channel that's part of the app. I didn't want to get into it in, in, unless I was asked about it, and you've asked about it. I was going to keep all this for discussion in the time frame, but, but we've got plenty of time. And uh, that's pretty neat too. I haven't done it myself because I primarily do um, uh, outreach with it. You know, that's what I bought it for and that's what I enjoy doing. But there's a lot of people enjoying hunting down stuff and they're they're getting quite good at it. And there's a couple of Facebook ones. There's um, the uh, EV Scope uh, worldwide and then there's one for EV Scope US and then there's a couple of others. And you can follow along and see a lot of the results on that too. It's pretty impressive. Yeah, thanks. Okay, Chris Nolan, uh, you want to unmute and ask your questions, and, and Bruce, you're next. Hey, just real quick, uh, I really appreciate the briefing. Uh, really good information there. Um, I just had two quick questions. Um, since you received the EV scope back in 2020, um, how often have you seen the software updated, especially concerning improving the user experience, the customer interface with that scope? Yeah. Uh, and that's a that's a that's a critical factor if you're going to get into something like this. Um, they are in it. the The secret sauce in this is the software, and that's where most of the cost has gone in their development. I mean, developing this what they've developed is non-trivial, and uh, and they I'm sure they're using kind of a DevOps model. And they've they've had two major releases. The first major release came with the introduction from it from Kickstarter, and they released about uh, Six, uh, six or seven major updates and about 10 or 15 minor updates over the course of two years. And then during uh, July, just uh, less than a month ago, they came out with release two and it's on their second release. And uh, it was a little bit buggy on the initial version two. It, it kept dropping operator mode and going to uh, observer mode and I would have to pop back to operator mode. But they fixed that pretty quickly within a week or two. In fact, the biggest lag was getting it through Apple's QA process to make sure that it didn't have any nefarious anything in it, you know, before they put it on their app store. So they were sitting there getting all of this, you know, these people that were spun up because it, it didn't work as solid as it did in the version one release. And they spent a, a huge amount of money re-engineering the user experience there. And it took a little bit of work to unlearn the muscle memory that was in version one to get over to version two. But after one session with it, I got used to it and 
and moved on to version two. And I like it a lot better now. At first I said, why did they do this? But it's not like anything else, you know, if you move text editors or move word processors or, you know, move uh, any software from one solution to another, you always like the one you learn first. And, uh, but you get over it pretty quick when you get the muscle memory back. And that's what happened here for me. Okay. And do I miss looking through a real eyepiece and seeing the actual sky object? Well, if I if my IP showed me the the objects that I could see with this, I would miss it. But my my four thousand dollar and five thousand dollar Quest stars that I've got don't show me these things. I can just see like you know, depending on what it is, I see what you see like through the binoculars that you just saw you know from the presentation that just preceded this. What I see from this is stuff that I can't see with my eye. You know, the cones and rods in my eye and the optics don't work. And so instead of optical enhancement for my eye, I'm using both optic, a combination of optical and electronic enhancement so that I can see things that only before I could only see if I captured it overnight and post-processed it with PixInsight or GIMP or, or whatever and did stretching and, and all the transformations and rotations and all the stuff you do with the uh, heavy duty post-processing stuff. So this is the only device I've seen where you can, you can go look at nebula structure and you can look at, uh, you know, it doesn't have a, a Bayer filter on it. And so, you know, it's capturing photons that my, that the human eye isn't sensitive to. And I see it in four, four eight or 10 seconds. And it starts getting better and better over 10 or 15 minutes. And I thoroughly enjoy it in a 20 minute observing session and move on to something else. And in the course of an evening, I can look at a whole bunch of stuff that I can't see through an optical eyepiece. Does that make sense? Or have I just swallowed too much Kool-Aid from these people? <laughs> <laughs> I laughed at that, Paul. That's good. I think that was a really good uh, representation of the difference. Because I think we were talking with Mary early, Paul. This is Chris Lee talking. Um, I, I mentioned talking about manually observing versus look, you know, taking photography. But, you know, when you can see something that you can't see any other way, and uh, it's, it's a great, great observation by you there. Yeah. You know, it's, you know if you're a microbiologist, uh, you know, I, I spent a fair amount of time in microbiology uh, innovation. Uh, and the, uh, if you're a microbiologist and you're looking at a, at a slide at bacteria and you're trying to identify anthrax or tularensis or something like that, you know, you're going to be pretty hard pressed to do anything. So you get out a microscope and that gets you part of the way, but you get out the electron microscope and look where you can go. Well, to me, you know, why would we as astronomers be upset if we can expand our ability to see what's out there by, and we can own it ourselves? We can't own the James Webb telescope, but we can darn sure own one of these. You know, it may be a little bit of a stretch now. And, um, uh, you know, in, in time, this is going to get picked up, I think, by the other vendors. It's just a matter of time. You know, they're the first on the block with it. There's been a couple of attempts at it. Uh, Queeve, the, the lazy geek who has a great YouTube channel, and um, he kind of took EV scope on as saying, oh, they're charging way too much money for this thing. Um, for less than $1,000, you can get all the stuff that, that they have, and, and it can be automated. And I said, well, that's interesting. So I bought the stuff that he had on there and built one. And um, it's not the same. The difference is that board that sits on top of the Raspberry Pi that has uh, all of the innovation in making the EV scope work. And then all of the engineering, the human factors engineering that they put into it. Those are the two things that they added in. Yes, you can go buy a, a Newtonian scope that's very good and you can get a alt as mount you know from uh, you know skywatcher and you can buy all of this stuff and you can do it for about a thousand bucks or eleven hundred bucks you can go buy a raspberry pi and you can put stellar mate on it and you can hook all this stuff together but it's not the same you've got wires hanging all over the place and i'll tell you just just getting the uh, little zwo camera hung on the back to do what the sony camera does on this and finding out where the sweet spot is for back focus and you know all that stuff that all of you that do astrophotography are familiar with you don't have to do any of that stuff with the ev scope it's just put together to do it and and so you you have all of your time focused on enjoying observing or showing objects to other people than you have fiddling around on the journey 
Now that's not to discount the journey. I love myself doing the journey and I thrive on putting those things together. But the imaging rig that I've got, I spent a year and a half putting together because I enjoyed doing systems integration. And then I'm going to enjoy the observing afterwards. But if you don't have the stomach for the systems integration and, um, and you don't have the stomach for the learning curve it takes to do some of this stuff, then it works out a lot better. Uh, that's a good lead into Bruce's question. And sure. Then, uh, then Mary has one after that. Yeah. If I look through the eyepiece on the newer version of the scope, uh, no, it's a, what it is, is a Nikon um, augmented eyepiece. So it's, uh, it, it, uh, it has some smarts in it, in the eyepiece that has some firmware that uh, does kind of what the iPhone 12 and 13 do. You know, they, it collects up multiple images and then the, uh, the iPhone does some uh, sharpening on the spot and does some contrast adjustment and those sorts of things. And uh, I didn't, I didn't see that it was that much of a difference for me to spend to buy another one and, and replace the one that I've got at this point. I'll wait for version three, see what they do there. I to tell you the truth, I haven't, even, I haven't even bothered to look through the eyepiece on the one I've got. It's. Uh, you know, the iPhone portion of it and the iPad portion of it are much larger screens. And so I, I, I just as soon look at that, that screen as to look at a, at a cheap screen that's buried inside the telescope. That's just a, you know, an inch by an inch and a half. Any follow-up on those questions? I yeah, have people, Paul. Yeah. I have people wander over and, and wonder where the eyepiece was because it's covered. You know? <laughs> Yeah, Paul. I uh, this is Bruce. I by asking the question about the real a real eyepiece, I wasn't challenging the wonderful technology that you you presented to us tonight. I too uh, am struggling as a photographer and have all the wires and all of that all that stuff. I just guess I remember the first time when I was probably about ten years old when I looked through an eyepiece and uh, managed to see what I could see through one of those things that was supposed to be six hundred X. And then yep. finally, and finally, getting uh, a genuine professional telescope and, and seeing some of the things I see, and what brought real joy was going to some of the Novak uh, outreach, and some of the kids uh, looking through and seeing some of these uh, globulars and uh, ring nebula and some some of the other things, and seeing that they're real and seeing them there in their eye and not on the iPad. And yep. um, I, I certainly can. I, I certainly am all. I, I'm in, I'm enthralled with Webb and and Hubble just as probably much as you are, but I guess I just uh, get nostalgic a little bit when I when I uh, have have seen the smiles and the energy created by the young ones when they actually look through the eyepiece and and I and I think there I get some satisfaction that that's not on an iPad it's 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 real and. Uh, I, I I also remember an evening I had uh, a discussion with a guy that said that uh, all of these pictures of galaxies and all were fake. Uh, they were the attempts of artists to, to portray and and to try to talk about wavelengths and spectra it was was an interesting uh, challenge to someone who didn't believe that those things were really out there. So uh, it, it wasn't that I was challenging your technology by asking the question. It was just a, perhaps a little nostalgic thought. No, I, I, Bruce, I'm with you 100%. In fact, I set up my, I have a Quest Star that's fantastic for the planetary stuff. And, I, and, and it doesn't have any enhancement in it at all. It has a nine volt battery to run the motor and that's it. And, um, and, I, and there's nothing better than showing kids the rings of Saturn and the, the red spot on Jupiter and uh, and then putting a solar filter on it and seeing sunspots and live and seeing prominence and all that. I think yeah. that's fantastic too. And you can set the two up right next to each other and experience both. They're complementary. They're not, it isn't having to make a choice of one or the other. There's no reason to judge one or the other as good or bad. They're both extremely complementary. I would agree with that. Okay, we're, we're running to our time here. Uh, Paul, really want to thank you for a very informative and educational uh, presentation. I, I learned a heck of a lot. 
And uh, having been totally humiliated when you sat up next to me one night out at Crockett and, and, and totally blew me away with, and I thought, you know, with my nine and a quarter uh, Casa Green, uh, you, you couldn't hold a candle, but, but people were so thrilled to walk away with something. And, and Mary was talking a little earlier uh, about, you know, how do we set proper expectations? And, and you know, James Webb or, or Unistellar or, or looking at the eyepiece, I love people looking up walking up a telescope and seeing the moon or Saturn or Jupiter for the first time and hearing that, Oh my God, is that real? And, and that's why I do so much outreach, but, but mm -hmm. it's you're this is something that's going to redefine it for all of us, I guess. And any final words from you on, on that? No, uh, thank you all. Uh, thanks for the questions. And I look forward to seeing you. And I look, if you come out to sky motos next month, come and look through it, or come and look at it. You can't look through it. Yeah. Come and look at it yourself. <laughs>